Well, good morning again, everybody. Thank you, President McLean, and thank you, Scott, for that beautiful um, introduction and for this award, which means the world to me. As you say, I'm a priest because of Thomas Aquinas. So to receive this medallion at this place, dedicated to St. Thomas, is an extraordinary honor to me. Can I say a quick word of gratitude to our senior speaker? Thank you uh, for that marvelous talk. And, and you'll hear everybody, and believe me, we didn't talk before, but you'll hear certain resonances around this theme of magnanimity today. Well, it is indeed a high honor for me to be speaking to the 2019 graduating class of Thomas Aquinas College, an institution that I've admired for decades and which is situated, I'm very proud to say, within the borders of my own Santa Barbara pastoral region. I'm deep, deeply grateful to President McLean, as well as to the Board of Governors and the faculty of this wonderful college. I want to offer a word of sincere and hearty congratulation, of course, to the class of 2019, but also to their parents. It's your love that has sustained them over the years, and this day belongs to you as much as to them. I distinctly remember my first visit to this beautiful campus. It was about five years ago. I'd been invited to speak to the community and had brought a fairly serious academic paper. After the long plane trip from Chicago and the surprisingly arduous car journey from LAX to Santa Paula, <laughs> I wasn't accustomed yet to Southern California traffic. I am now. Well, after all that, I was fairly worn out, and I was convinced that my dense presentation would bore the students and probably myself to tears. <laughs> and so it was, over in this room here, I think, with some trepidation, I made my way through the text. But then, to my delighted surprise, I entertained smart and challenging questions for the next hour and three quarters. As I remember, President McLean had to intervene to bring things to a close, even as dozens of hands remained in the air. Now, in my wildest imagination, it would never have occurred to me that night that I'd one day be the bishop presiding over this region. But I must say that one of the particular joys of my current assignment is that I can make frequent visits to this college and experience again the thrill of that initial encounter with the bright and delightfully feisty students here. <laughs> so, how could I not take as my point of orientation today some thoughts from the patron of the school and my own intellectual hero? I want to draw your attention to a fairly obscure section of St. Thomas's Summa, namely question 129 of the Segunda Segunda, wherein the master considers, as we heard earlier, the virtue of magnanimitas, magnanimity, which is to say the quality of having a great soul. There's an intriguing etymological link, by the way, between the term magna anima in Latin and the Sanskrit title famously ascribed to Mohandas Gandhi, Mahatma, which means precisely the same thing, great soul. So how does St. Thomas elaborate upon the notion? Well, here's the beginning of his respondio to Article 1 of question 129, I'm quoting now. Magnanimity by its very name denotes stretching forth of the soul to great things, extensio animi ad magna, Thomas says. And this has primarily to do with great moral acts or acts for which one would expect to be honored. Thomas is quick to clarify that the magnanimous person is not interested in honors for their own sake. Such an obsession would amount to what he calls vana gloria, vain glory. Rather, he or she is interested in doing those things that rightly deserve honor. Following Aristotle, Thomas further specifies that true magnanimity is ordered to high honor which is another way of saying, to the performance of those moral acts that are particularly hard to perform. Here's part of the respondio to Article 5 of Question 129. I'm quoting again. Accordingly, it's clear that magnanimity agrees with fortitude in confirming the mind about some difficult matter, close quote. And this from 
Article 6 of the same question, quoting again, magnanimity is chiefly about the hope of something arduous. Magnanimitas propria circa spem aliquius ardui, Thomas says. But what's the ground for such hope? It is, says Thomas Aquinas, in the moral and intellectual character of the one who knows himself capable of attaining to high, difficult, and great things. Were one not in possession of the capacity for greatness, it would be presumptuous and proud to strive toward excellence. Some further light can be shed upon our theme by considering the opposite of magnanimity, namely pusillanimity, literally small souledness. And this Thomas does in question 133 of the Segunda Segunda. If presumption makes one strive beyond one's capabilities, pusillanimity, I'm quoting now, makes a man fall short of what is proportionate to his power by refusing to tend to that which is commensurate thereto, close quote. In light of this clarification, we can see why some translators choose to render pusillanimitas as faint-heartedness, for it amounts to a fear of attempting the moral excellence of which a person is capable. In Article 2 of Question 133, Aquinas makes the contrast unmistakably clear. I'm quoting now. For just as the magnanimous man tends to great things out of greatness of soul, so the pusillanimous man shrinks from great things out of littleness of soul, ex animi parvitate. And what causes this shrinking of the soul? Thomas says, I'm quoting again, on the part of the intellect, ignorance of one's qualifications, and on the part of the appetite, the fear of failure in what one falsely deems to exceed one's ability, close quote. I trust by now it's become plain why I chose to take us on this brief tour of a usually overlooked corner of Aquinas' masterpiece. It seems to me that the entire purpose of the programs here at Thomas Aquinas College is to produce magnanimous people, young women and men of great souls, capable of high moral achievement, willing and able to undertake arduous tasks for which they will rightly merit great honor. Thomas Aquinas College, it seems to me, has no interest in giving rise to pusillanimous graduates, men and women with small souls who would shrink from the difficult moral challenge of the present time. Given what you've learned here through strenuous effort in the classroom, given how your souls have been shaped by steady exposure to people of exemplary virtue, given the formation that has inevitably come from the mass and the sacraments, none of you graduates ought to feel unqualified, either intellectually or morally, to seek the most honorable course. God knows the world is filled with moral mediocrities, not to mention the craven and the wicked, but you have been made of sterner stuff. Aquinas tells us that one of the principal marks of the magnanimous person is confidence. We send you forth today as confident men and women, ready for the high adventure of the spiritual life. Now, sufficient challenges certainly rise to meet the confidence of the magnanimous today. And many of those who preceded me in this role of commencement speaker have articulated them. It was a great joy, by the way, to go back on the internet and to find a lot of the speeches that were given from this very podium. Speakers mention materialism, ideological secularism, moral relativism, and the fruit of these three, namely a culture of self-invention, a sort of Nietzschean voluntarism which has emerged, I think, as the dominant philosophy of our time. What I'd like to do in the short compass of this speech is to focus on two particular challenges that I think call forth heroic moral excellence, namely the corruption in the church 
and the massive attrition of our own Catholic people, especially the young. There's no need to rehearse the sickening details regarding the sexual abuse of young people by priests these last several decades. Suffice to say that attacks on the bodies and souls of the most vulnerable members of the Catholic community, precisely by those ordained by Christ to be shepherds and guardians, constitutes the gravest scandal in the history of the church in this country. Compounding the problem, of course, has been the mismanagement of the crisis on the part of some bishops and religious superiors. More concerned with the reputation of the institution than with the safety of God's people, too many ecclesial leaders allowed this rot to spread. If you seek distant historical mirrors of the present troubles, take a look at St. Peter Damien's writings in the 11th century, or the story of Eli and his wicked sons Hophni and Phinehas from the first book of Samuel in the Old Testament. Wicked priests and clueless religious superiors are sadly nothing particularly new in the life of God's people. Undermining the work of the church in practically every way, the sex abuse scandal, this catastrophe has been, as I've termed it, the devil's masterpiece. And I realize that in the wake of these revelations, many Catholics are tempted to abandon ship. In fact, in a very recent poll, fully 37% of Catholics say they are seriously considering leaving the church because of this corruption. But it's my conviction that this is not the time to leave. This is the time to fight. And here I call upon every magnanimous graduate sitting here before me today. Fight by entering the priesthood or religious life and living up to the dignity of your calling. Fight by the very holiness of life, becoming the saint that God wants you to be. Fight by doing a holy hour every day for the purification of the church. Fight by calling for real reform. Fight by insisting that the guilty be held accountable. Fight by doing the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. Fight by evangelizing in your everyday life. Fight by ordering your life according to the virtues. Fight by playing your priestly role in the sacrifice of the Mass. And more to it, fight by sanctifying your family, your workplace, the market, the political arena, the world of high finance, the realms of sports and entertainment. In other words, be what the church is supposed to be in the world. In the second book of Samuel, we hear that David's corruption with Bathsheba commenced precisely when the king, instead of going on campaign as was his wont, lingered at home, indulging his private desires. As Pope Francis has often reminded us, when the church fails to go on campaign, when it turns in on itself, corruption is never far behind. Don't wait for other reformers to arise. This is your moment to meet this crucial moral challenge. And no pusillanimous people need apply. The second great crisis to which I'll draw your attention is the rise of the nuns. I don't mean N-U-N-S, I mean the N-O-N-E-S. <laughs> or the religiously unaffiliated. When I was a child in the early 1970s, roughly 3% of our country identified as non-religious. By the early 1990s, that figure had doubled to 6%, but still in terms of absolute numbers, the overwhelming majority of the nation was religious. However, today, nearly 25% of Americans surveyed claim no religious affiliation. And the situation is dire still when we focus on young people. Among those under 30, fully 40% in our country claim the status of no religion. Among Catholics under 30, the number rises to 50%. Any way one looks at these statistics, one must conclude that we're hemorrhaging young people from religion in general and Catholicism in particular. In point of fact, one of the most damning figures is the ratio between those who join the Catholic Church and those who are leaving. It stands at one to six. That is to say, for every one person entering our church, 
six are going out the door. I call upon the magnanimous graduates of this college to rise to meet this challenge, which is especially strong among your own peers. And may I say that as alumni of this college, you are uniquely positioned to do so. Numerous studies have indicated that the principal reason people are leaving the church today is they no longer believe the doctrines put forth by classical Christianity. Though many commentators are tempted to say that the mass exodus is prompted largely by the scandals, this in fact is not true. When queried why they've left the practice of the faith, most people, especially the young, tell us they've done so because faith and science are implacable enemies, because God is an unnecessary hypothesis, because Jesus is one questionable mythic character among many, because the Bible is a collection of pre-scientific fairy tales, etc., etc. In a word, they're finding Christianity intellectually untenable. You have all had the incomparable privilege these past four years carefully and critically to read Aristotle, Plato, Cicero, Newton, Aquinas, and even critics of religion, Kant, Hegel, Bertrand Russell, etc. And this makes you specially qualified for the arduous task of engaging the army of skeptics who have wandered from the church. The contemplation of the great intellectuals is indeed an intrinsic good, but may I stress that especially at this moment in the church's life, such contemplation can and should give rise to active evangelization and compelling apologetics. So, magnanimous graduates, become university professors of theology, college and high school teachers of religion, catechists at the parish level, online evangelists, and know that the moment you exit any Catholic church in America, you have entered mission territory. For many years, I lived and worked at Mundelein Seminary, as you heard, outside of Chicago. A blend of extraordinary natural beauty and extremely fine Georgian architecture, the seminary is one of the most striking places in the American Catholic world. Cardinal Mundelein, who actively presided over its design and construction, said he wanted the splendor of the seminary to give the future priests an idea of heaven so that they would never lose sight of the ultimate goal of their pastoral work among the people. This place here, Thomas Aquinas College, with its own distinctive blend of natural and man-made beauty, has always reminded me a bit of Mundelein Seminary. And indeed, this campus, where liturgy, prayer, fellowship, deep communion with the saints and geniuses of the Catholic tradition are on steady offer, is something of a Catholic heaven on earth. An anticipation even now of the splendor of life on high with God and the saints. But just as the students at Mundelein are not meant to stay on the grounds of the seminary, so you are not meant to stay at this lovely place. Rather, you are meant to go forth, carrying what you've received and cultivated here in order to sanctify our suffering world. Is this an arduous task? Yes. But magnanimous people like arduous tasks for their order to the moral work that will give the highest honor. Are these choppy seas today? You bet. But only pusillanimous people are afraid of choppy seas. Your four years here have given you great souls. Let them be unleashed. God bless you all.